time for Jesus. Make some noise. Let's go, let's go, let's go. You don't think Jesus can heal people. You haven't been paying attention. You don't know if you believe in miracles. You ain't paying attention. I'm just tell you right now, man, the spirit of God can do anything he chooses to do at any given point of time. All we have to do, the Bible says, to have the faith of a mustard seed. The faith of a mustard seed, the Bible says, can move a mountain. Now, we either believe God's word or we don't believe God's word. It's real simple. It's not, well, let's just study. What is there to study about that? If we believe God can do anything, the Bible says nothing is too hard for the Lord. I I've watched on the prayer line today and really all weekend long, we had our freedom conference. Hello, freedom people, where are you at? <laughs> Woo! Let me just tell you, I say it every time. If you haven't gone through freedom yet, our small group freedom, it's 13 week course and immediately you go, I can't do it, I can't commit to 13 weeks. You are robbing yourself right now from the opportunity to experience life change. Listen, why do these people get excited? Why do they get pumped up? Because listen, once you get to the conference, tremendous miracles take place. The, the enemy's grip is lifted off of people and we watch God, I watch God do so many miracles this weekend that I could go for hours upon hours upon hours telling you all the stories of, and then this person, had, and then this person, and then this, what happened? And it's like, dude, are you serious right now? Every semester that we do this, that conference grows and grows and grows and gets bigger every time. This is the biggest conference uh, that, that we've had, most amount of people that came and the most amount of deliverance and being set free that, that I've seen. It was incredible what God did. And people worship different after conference. You go, man, there's a lot of people here today. Well, people go, yeah, I probably need to be at church every week after conference. He's like, dude, oh, there's growth whenever we invite the Holy Spirit in. It's exciting, man, it's exciting. So we've been doing this series called The First Families and uh, studying through the book of Genesis. And so if you're kind of new to the church, you're like, how's this work? Dude, I'm just, I opened up the Bible at page one and was like, what does it say? Let's read it and then like, let's go. And then we just kind of started working through it since January. And so we've been in Genesis pretty much all year and uh, we're gonna keep studying today. But before I do get into this message, I wanna remind you and invite you. I wanna remind you that our Wednesday youth ministry meets at 5.30 right here in the gymnasium. They have open gym, games, activities, tons of fun. This Wednesday is Nerf gun night. Hello, it's gonna, listen, what does that mean? It means I'm gonna be shooting your teenagers with Nerf guns for like an hour, all right? And uh, they're probably gonna shoot me back, but I'm not too worried. I'm, I'm, I'm ready, okay? But from 5.30 to eight, every Wednesday, we do youth ministry and our youth ministry is exploding right now. It is on fire. Tons of people this age group. And if you have a student sixth through 12th grade, or if you are a student sixth through 12th grade, Dude, you're missing out by not being here on Wednesdays. I'm just telling you straight up right now. Youth camp's coming up here in about a month. And if you've got a student that wants to go to youth camp, come see me. We'll get them all signed up and ready to go. Are you ready for God's word today? Say yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. Today, the goal of this message is simply that we would learn the lesson, we reap what we sow. Everybody try to say that with me. We reap what we sow. One more time, we reap what we sow, that's, that's the message. Now, in the book of Genesis, we've been studying some different characters. We started with a guy uh, by the name, he starts with an A, anybody remember? Abraham, and he had a son named Isaac, and he had a son named Jacob, and he had a brother, Jacob had a brother named? Esau, that's right. Every once in a while, I feel like a pretty decent pastor. Thank you guys for remembering. And as we walk into this idea of Jacob and Esau, if you don't recall, there's some facts about Jacob that we see here that I wanna to bring to light today. Um, his name in Hebrew actually means, say it with me, it means deceiver. Jacob means deceiver. So any, any Jacobs in the room? You don't have to raise your hand, right? It'd be a little awkward moment to raise your hand right now. But, but in Hebrew, it means deceiver. And we, we remember that Jacob actually did deceive his brother Esau, and he did it a couple ways. What did he do? What did he take from him? His birthright, hey, there we go. He stole the birthright. What else did he steal from his brother? He stole the blessing. Y'all are on fire today. 
on fire day. He stole the birthright and the blessing. And remember, the blessing was really important because patriarchs or fathers of our faith are like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's how we know them. They're the founders, the fathers of our faith. Kind of everything springboards off of them. But when he stole the blessing, the blessing is actually the, the family tree branch for which Jesus is actually gonna come out of. So the blessing should have went to the oldest, which would have been Esau, but whenever he deceived his father, if you were here a couple weeks ago, you know that Jacob deceived his father and tricked him and he ended up getting the blessing because it should have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Unfortunately, because it was stolen, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So now we've got this new family lineage that's starting out with Jacob and Esau's not happy about having his birthright and his blessing stolen from him and he was deceived. One verse a couple of chapters ago, it says this, isn't he rightly named Jacob, deceiver? This is the second time that this guy's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. Esau wasn't happy and he wasn't happy and he even made a vow at the end of this chapter and he said, when my dad dies, when Isaac passes, I'm going to get revenge on my brother. I'm going to kill my brother. Kind of where we stopped and left off. You're like, whoa, what's going to happen in this story? Don't forget that because we're going to continue to talk about it in weeks to come. Today, though, we're in Genesis 29. If you've been with us the last 29 weeks, here we are. All right, 29. We're going to read verses 1 through 30 and kind of break it down. It says, then Jacob continued on his journey and came to the land of the eastern peoples. He continued on his journey because he knew, I can't stay at home. This is a toxic environment. My brother hates me. If my dad dies, he's going to kill me. I've got to leave the house. Remember when mom said, hey, you know, it'll be okay. Let's deceive your dad. Let the curse fall on me. Here's what the curse actually was. The curse that fell on mom was unfortunately she wasn't going to see her son because he had to leave in order to not be dead. that's, That's a heavy heavy thing to bear. Verse two, there he saw a well, Jacob saw a well in the open country with three flocks of sheep lying near it because the flocks were were watered from that well. The stone over the mouth of the well was large. So Jacob goes out and he sees all these sheep everywhere in the open country and he sees a well and a large rock is on top of the well. And the well was really important because it was a resource. And, and if you had a well, you were pretty wealthy because you had water, you had clean water, you had fresh water and you could water the animals, you could drink the water yourself. It was to keep you alive, it sustained you. And so they would put a large rock over the mouth of the well because they didn't want any of the water to be contaminated. And it was a large rock also because they didn't want one person really to be able to move it easily. They wanted it to take a couple people because it would slow the enemy down because if the enemy came through, they would actually uh, take the rock off of the well and fill it with dirt and contaminate all the water and stop the well up. So that way, you know, it would weaken you and that's what the enemy would do. So large rock is over the mouth of the well. And then we read in the next verse in verse three, when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth and they would water the sheep. Then they would return the stone to its place over the mouth of the well. Again, for the reason I just said, to stop the enemies, slow them down from trying to do stuff. Think of it like this. When you go to the refrigerator and you get the milk out, mom's gonna get mad if you don't put the cap back on the milk jug, right? And put it back. Don't lose the cap and put it in there. What are we doing, right? Same type of process. We don't wanna contaminate the well, so we need to put the, the rock back over it. Jacob asked the shepherds, he said, my brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they replied. He said to them, do you know Laban? Anybody remember Laban? Laban? Okay, yeah, we skimmed over that pretty quick. Oh man, not a soul. Y'all, y'all missed that week. Y'all missed that, you remember. Good. I love you now. I love you now. We're certain that guy's going to heaven now, right? Because he knew that. <laughs> That's not how that works. But Shane, I love you, brother. You know I do. Laban was the uncle of the family. He was the uncle of the family. So he says, yes, we know Laban. He answered, then Jacob asked them, is he doing well? Yes, he is, they said. And here 
here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. Laban's got a daughter. You know Laban? Oh, yeah, I know Laban. You're connected. Oh, cool, cool. Oh, there's his daughter. Now, Jacob hasn't seen his uncle Laban in a long time. He was a little boy last time this kind of came around. And so, so he's growing up, and he sees uh, the daughter Rachel with the sheep. Look, he said, the sun is still high. It is not time for the flocks to be gathered. Water the sheep and then take them back to the pasture. Listen to what the shepherd said. The shepherd said, we can't. We can't water the sheep until all the flocks are gathered and the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the well. Until somebody moves that gigantic rock off there, we can't do anything about watering these sheep. Once that's moved, then we will water the sheep. While he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherd. Now let me explain what's about to happen. This is about to be a love at first sight moment right here in the Bible. Y'all know love at first sight? Who, who's had some love at first sight moments? Come on, don't, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed, okay? Love at first sight moments, and, and you get googly eyes, and you're like, oh, wow, right? It, it, and your heart skips a couple beats. This is about to happen. And, and this is, Rachel's a shepherd. She was, this is like little Bo Peep in Toy Story, right? It's like, hey, Bo Peep. And so when, when Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban, and Laban's sheep, he went over and he, let me say it like this, modern terms. He shot his shot. He flexed a little bit up in this moment. Here's what he did. He went over and he rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and he watered his uncle's sheep. We'll see if it works for him, all right? He's shooting his shot. Let me, let me, let me kind of say men and women. Can we agree men and women are different? Say yes. They're different. Men and women are different. I go to the gym every day. Joe, my trainer, sitting right up here on the front row. If you need a training, you want to get buff and big, you want to look like Joe, you need to come see Joe. And then you got to do what he says in order to make it work. But, but let me just tell you, at the gym, men and women are different. Now, women, whenever they go to work out, they're like, I don't want to talk to you. You're, you're a weirdo if you just come up and start talking to me. You're a creep. Why are you talking to me right now? I'm here to work out, dude. Get away. Like they get mad, right? Dudes in the gym are like, oh, there's pretty ladies in this room. <laughs> wow. And their eyes are like, like Jacob seeing Rachel. Whoa. And then for some reason, men and women are very different. Men are idiots, okay? Let me, let me explain. They think because that pretty lady's over there, I'm gonna put, 45 more pounds of weight on each side of this bench right here. And I'm gonna try to lift more weight than I know that I can absolutely lift. And I'm gonna about injure myself and kill myself and have a heart attack right here on this bench in hopes that maybe she might look up and see me benching too much weight, killing myself and unable to breathe and then think, wow, he's strong. I want to be with him now. <laughs> Joe, are we lying? That's the way that it works at the gym. Men, I've never seen it work like this one time where you lifted too much weight and then she came flocking to you. Never saw it happen. But hey, different story, different day. Jacob saw Rachel and he's like, dude, I know it takes more than one guy to lift that stone but I'm gonna shoot my shot. And he goes over there and he, he lifts this large stone off and he gets it off there. And you know, Bo Peep, or I'm sorry, Rachel is watching and it's like, got all the sheep there. And he's like, let me water the sheep for you. You know, let, let me do it. And then this next verse, uh, we gotta see if it worked out with, with him. Um, then Jacob kissed Rachel. That's a little forward. <laughs> okay, like, <laughs> Get some water. Come here. <laughs> like, like, what, 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 what? Then Jacob kissed Rachel. And I don't know if the writer just forgot to write that she punched him and that's why he began to weep aloud. We're not sure what, no, I'm just joking. The Bible doesn't have any errors or flaws. This is what it says. Jacob kissed Rachel and 
Jacob began to weep aloud. He was really excited to see this woman. Now I thought, well, guys, have we been doing it wrong this whole time? Maybe we're supposed to. And I thought, that can't be right. Let's read the next verse. Can't just be that he moved the stone and then kissed her. Oh, there it is. He had a conversation with Rachel. That makes a little more sense now. So he, he, he talked and he told Rachel, he had already told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebecca. So she ran and told her father. They're like, oh, we got some connections. We know some people. We got it all figured out. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. So Uncle Laban's coming out. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And there Jacob told him all these things. Then Laban said to him, you are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob stayed with him for a whole month. Now real quick, just so you got the context. This is like long lost distant relative that I haven't seen in a long time. For instance, we live in the, the Texas area. Maybe you got some relatives that live in other states, other parts of the world, and you haven't talked to them in 10, 15, 20 years. And also, you know who they are, your Facebook friends, but you don't know anything about them really. And, and they're coming to town and you open up your home. You're like, okay, my cousin's in town. My, my family's in town, whatever. This is what's happening. And Jacob's come from a far distant land and he stays there for a whole month. Verse 15 says, Laban said to him, just because you're a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Because Jacob wasn't a freeloader. He wasn't just living there and eating all the food and not pulling his weight and leaving dishes everywhere and leaving everything all over the place, keeping trash out. No, 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 no. He was pulling his weight. He was doing his part of the responsibility. And, and Laban said, hey man, it's not good that you work for free. What do I need to pay you because of this service you're providing? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was, say it with me, the name of the older was Leah, and the name of the, uh, the younger was Rachel. Rachel and Leah, Rachel and Leah, Rachel and Leah. Everybody remember Rachel and Leah, because I hope in the future when I quiz you about the, uh, the daughters of Laban, you'll go, oh yeah, that's just Rachel and Leah. I know who those people are. This is where the story gets really, really fun, y'all. Right here is so fun. Verse 17, Leah, had weak eyes. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but I, I studied this week and I have a couple, uh, you know, people, theologians that have said different things. Anybody have any guesses what weak eyes means? Maybe a lazy eye, what else? maybe cross-eyed. We don't know, and you said that, I didn't. I ain't daring saying anything like that up on the stage. Leah had weak eyes. One translation actually made it sound like um, that, that when other people looked at Leah, it, it hurt their eyes. <laughs> they had weak eyes. Oh, right? Like, oh, my eyes hurt because of it. Um, Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. So we're going to see some stuff with the sisters here soon. This is where it gets really interesting. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Like I'll stay here and I'll work hard, I'll do whatever. I love her, I don't wanna be with her. Laban said, <laughs> dudes are funny, guys are so weird. It's better that I give her to you than some other man, right? Like, like ah, yeah, I guess you're okay, it, 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 we'll, we'll do what it is. Stay here with me, I guess, you know, I guess it could be worse than you. And, and then in verse 20, so Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but check this out, ladies in the room, check this out, this is where it gets in. But they seem like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Can we just go, aww, that's sweet. It's Mother's Day, y'all, it's Mother's Day, aww. Love in the house, love. It feels like only just a few days went by. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, because my time is completed, <laughs> and I want to go make love to her, okay? <laughs> like, like, he's been engaged for seven years, waiting to be with this woman. He says, my time is completed and I wanna make love to her. Anybody engaged in the house who's engaged? Yeah, there you are right there, I see you. Dylan, how much more time? 
before you get married. When's the due date? How many? Three months. When'd you get engaged? Uh, April, 15th. April, so like a month ago. He ain't spending any time waiting. He said, my time is completed and I wanna make love to her. <laughs> Something like that, all right, so here we go. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and he gave a feast. So Laban's like, hey, okay, we're gonna have this marriage. Your time's been completed, you, 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 you wanted my daughter. And so, yeah, we're gonna have a big feast. And I, guys, I'm running out of time. I don't have time to tell you all the details about the feast, but I want you to go home and I want you to do some homework. Read in your commentary, read, read in your Bible about the type of feast and the customs of the feast and the way that the feast operated because it's gonna give you a lot of insight as to these next few verses. You say, I don't even care to know that, so why would I waste time doing that? Because in the next few verses, it's gonna be like, what? So Laban brought together all the people of the place, gave a feast, but when evening came, he took his daughter, uh, Leah, hello, and brought her to Jacob. And look at this verse. And Jacob made love to her. Huh? What? You go, how in the world could that possibly happen? Go read in the commentary, see homework. If you wanna know stuff, you're gonna have to open your Bible and learn it and read it, okay? But there it is. So, so he made love to Leah, the other one, the, the one he didn't even want. And Laban gave his servant Zilpah to his daughter as an attendant. So he gets Leah and Leah gets this assistant uh, to go be an attendant with her. And so Jacob's in this situation. I've just worked seven years. I've got two ladies now, a part of my family. I didn't even know this was gonna happen like this. I wanted to be with Rachel. And look at this verse. When morning came, there was Leah. <laughs> so Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? You go, how did he not know? Go study, go study, go study. I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you, oh, what's this word? Why have you, say it with me, deceived me? Are you saying right now, pastor, that the deceiver got deceived? Mm-hmm. The deceiver got deceived. Laban replied, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Like, I know we had an agreement, but you must not have read the fine print in our contract, son. You worked your seven years, but it ain't customary for us to do the younger before the older. You gotta be married to her. Like, what are you talking about? Can you imagine how mad you'd be if you were in this situation? You're like, are you kidding me? I'm ready to drop some hands, let's go. Like, we're gonna do something. Finish the daughter's bridal week. Hey ladies, look, it, hey, bridal week. You gotta go study. What does a bridal week? You get a whole week? Yeah, you get a bridal week. Go study what that means. You don't have time to explain it. Finish the daughter's bridal week. Then we will give you the younger one also, but check it out in return for another seven years of work. <laughs> He's like, you gotta sign another agreement with me, bro. You want my other daughter? Like, she's beautiful. If you want her, what are you gonna do about it? But look at this, verse 28. And Jacob, he did so, because he loved her. So I'm willing to work 14 years. Uh, by the way, let me just say this to the single people in the room, to the single ladies specifically. You need to have a bigger, higher standard for yourself and for the person that's gonna be with you than you do. This dude was willing to work 14 years to go be with her. Some of y'all just, hey, if you've taken me out three times, then we can, you know, you're just giving away all the goods. What are you doing? Come on, you're worth more than that. And, and somebody needs to show you that you're worth more than that. Don't accept less than God's best for your life. Can I get an amen, anybody? Okay, don't accept God's less than God's best. And Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. And Laban gave his servant, Bilhah, to his daughter, Rachel, as her attendant. So he's like, I'm gifting you with a couple people to attend and help you along the way. So Jacob walks out of here with four new ladies on his side. They're like, what are we doing here, right? More on that to come. We'll read the Bible and learn more about what that means. But let's read verse 30. It says, Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah, and he worked uh, for Laban another seven years. This is gonna lead to a problem whenever he loves Rachel more than Leah. We'll talk more later. Goal of this message today, that we would learn the lesson, we reap what we sow. Everybody say, we reap what we sow. Say it again, we reap what we sow. Definition of reaping what you sow. 
to experience the same kind of things that one has caused other people to experience. To experience the same kind of things back that we've caused other people to experience. Let's wrap up that part of the story. His name in Hebrew means deceiver. He stole the birthright, the blessing. He was deceived by Laban. We've come full circle. He reaped what he sowed. He deceived, therefore he was deceived. This is one passage of the Bible that talks about reaping what you sow. There's lots of times in the Bible where it talks about reaping what you sow. This just was the page I flipped to. I said, what's this message about? It's about reaping what you sow. Let me put a bow on this package though and give you a few scriptures that are not right there. Galatians 6, 7 through 10 says this. (laughs) Here it is plainly, a man reaps what he sows. All right, so there it is. Not one time we see, this is a lot of times you see a man reaps what he sows. Then it says, whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Now process that for a second. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. From time to time I have people come and ask me, I get a ton of random questions all the time about all sorts of things. And I never know from one person to the next what the category will be. It's like, I'll choose, you know, this category for 200. And, you know, it's boom. It's question, question, question. Some people ask me things like this. They say, Pastor, what do you think about people who smoke cigarettes? Is it okay for me to smoke cigarettes? Should I not smoke cigarettes? And then typically it would be followed up by a, uh, an alcohol question. And I don't know if they drink or if they don't drink. And I don't even know if they... I don't know if they wanna know for some other purpose or if it's just to see what I would say. I have no clue, but I do give them responses. So they say, Pastor, do you do, you do cigarettes? And I say, no, I don't do cigarettes. They say, do you drink? I say, no, I don't, I don't do that either. And they say, well, is there a reason why? And I said, let me give you like three or four reasons why. I'm gonna walk through them real quick. The first one is really simple. I can't afford to buy a pack of cigarettes the way that y'all buy cigarettes today. So, so number one is just, you ain't got the, the resource they ain't there, boom, I ain't got, okay, then, then I can't do it. So there's number one. I got five kids, y'all. My kids eat all my money. I ain't got no money, all right? So, so, so it's like, like, I can't do it for that reason. Then also I go, you know, on the smoking thing, I've never wanted to smoke because when I was in school and I was in elementary, they had this uh, fire marshal come in. Y'all remember the fire marshal visit at the school? He'd come in and and he would tell you, if there's ever a fire, there's three things you do. Does anybody remember what you do if there's a fire? You stop, drop, and roll. See, the fire marshal preaches better than the preacher does. Y'all remember when the fire marshal talks, y'all don't remember when I talk. I'm praying about that. Come on, pray with me. So he stopped, drop, and roll. And then he also said something else. He said, you know, fires aren't what kill people when there's a fire in the house. He said, he said, the fire doesn't just burn the person and they die. He said, what actually happens is they, they what? What happens? They inhale the smoke. And then what happens is it becomes too much and then they pass out and then they get burned up. So when I was in elementary and I learned that and then somebody you know, in my teen years offered me a cigarette, I said, no thanks. I said, why didn't you want one? Come on, take one. I was like, huh? I scared the fire, I was like, huh? They're like, I, why? I said, because the smoke's gonna kill me, dude. What's the Bible say? Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. You say, why don't you drink? Well, I don't drink because I got five kids, y'all, and they ate all my money. You say, what's the Bible say about drinking? There's no question what the Bible says about drinking. Let's clear clear it up for everybody in the room, okay? The Bible says 100% do not get drunk. Do not get drunk. Clear as day in the Bible. Lots of verses talk about it. Bible doesn't say you can't have a drink. Doesn't say that. People think that that's what that says. Just if we read the Bible, we can see what it says, okay? Here's the caution though. You say, well, pastor, if it says it's okay for you to have a drink, why don't you have a drink? I don't have a drink because unfortunately in my family, I have three family members that have lost their life due to alcohol. Three. One's enough. Two's too many, right? Three's a lot. I had uh, one, one of my family members that had a DUI and hit somebody and really injured them and he lost his life. So like drinking to me has zero good purpose. I can't find the good. I'm struggling as a person who's lost three people in my family to find the good with alcohol. So you go, pastor, why don't you? Cause I can't, dude, I would never, I, I, I don't want to, no interest, right? 
And then I start unpacking the spiritual reasons. Then I go into, let me tell you why I don't think it's good. I think that the enemy is at work here. Let me tell you how the enemy is at work. You don't have to agree with me. You don't even like what I'm saying. That's fine. Let me just present it to you. I think the enemy wants you to be dependent on some things other than God. Because let's be truthful. When we're smoking, when we're consuming alcohol, when we're shooting up, when we're doing whatever it is that we're doing to our flesh, what we're intaking in our flesh, the Bible says from the flesh will reap destruction. That it doesn't pan out good for us in the end. We all know the package on the carton of cigarettes says this will cause cancer. And we're like, I know, right? Like, but why do we do it? We do it because we're self-medicating. We're self-medicating. We're medicating because we don't like the pain and the weight and the feelings that we feel about life. We're depressed, we're discouraged, we're whatever, and we wanna medicate away. Here's the problem. When we medicate away and we put our dependence on those things to feel good, what we're not doing is putting our dependency on God. So theologically speaking, biblically speaking, I would say those things are at in in competing, they're competing for the place of God in my life. And I don't want my dependency to be anywhere else but on God. The Bible says, whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. That there's a blessing that comes whenever we do right, when we do what's good for us. Bible says, do not be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, let me tell you something. People that are addicted to these things, and there's a lot of you in the room. I know your stories. Some of you, many of you have told me, and many of you have not. But the truth is, a lot of people are dependent on many things. What we need to be doing is coming up to the prayer line and saying, God, release me from these addictive habits. Release me from this. And let me just tell you, I'll be the first to tell you, I understand that addiction is hard to break. It's not easy. I get it. There's another reason I, I don't do either of those things. Um, my, my aunt actually, on one of my sides, my aunt, I remember growing up as a, as a kid, even in my teen years, and they were always moving. My cousins were always moving all the time. And I, I was like, okay, they clearly are poor. We, we all were kind of, we, well, we were very poor didn't have money, but I couldn't understand how if we didn't have money and we were always moving, why are they buying all these cartons of cigarettes and why are they consuming all this alcohol and not being able to keep a roof over our head? Which leads me to, to the strategy of the enemy. I think not only does the devil wanna steal, kill and destroy you, and he does it through this physical medication that we're doing and this harm, but he also wants to drain your resources, man. He wants to rob you. When you're spending that money in that way, you're not spending the money really on the way that God intended for it to be in your hand at all. And I go, what could you do with that same money that would be so much more productive and beneficial if the habit could be broken? The problem is when I talk to people who are addicted, whether you feel like you're an addict or not, you say, I can quit at any time. No, you can't. Um, At the end of the day, when I talk to them, when I talk to them, they always say, it's too hard, I can't. Bible says, let us not become weary in doing good. Let us not, let us not become weary. Let's not get tired for pursuing the right thing. Because sometimes you go, I'm gonna quit, and then you you start again. I'm gonna quit, and then you start again. I'm gonna quit, and I'm gonna start again. Listen, don't give up on the idea of I'm gonna move past this addiction. I'm here to tell you I'm in your corner, and I'm for you, and I support you, and I want what's best for you. And if if you need help in some way, moving past, come talk to me. I don't know if I'll know the answer right off, but I'm gonna help you any way I can. We gotta break through the addiction because the Bible says for the, at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. There's a reward to have if you don't give up, if you break it through it. But let me tell you, people don't break through it because I give an encouraging word. People break through it because the power of the Holy Spirit on the prayer line allows them to break every chain in Jesus' name. That's how that works. And listen, listen, lean in. It can happen for you too. 
Don't believe it can't. Don't let the enemy tell you it can't. This is reaping what you sow. He says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And that's what I hope that you see I'm trying to sow into you today. I'm trying to do good to the family of believers. And I'm trying to say, hey, any way I can help, you let me know. I wanna sow into you because I think God's got a better plan for your life. That's one area where it talks about reaping and sowing. Everybody say, reap what you sow. Okay, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. We talked about giving and tithing. I'll tell you, those that, that give sparingly, they just get back sparingly. Those that give generously will reap back generously. I didn't write it. You can disagree. That's fine. It's just God's word. You're just disagreeing. You're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with him. You reap what you sow. Everybody say, you reap what you sow. sow. Proverbs, whoever sows injustice, if you cheat people, you harm people, you manipulate people, whoever sows injustice reaps calamity and the rod they yield in fury will be broken. Whoever sows injustice reaps back calamity. You aren't gonna get away with that. In other words, whatever you put out, you're gonna get back and it ain't gonna look pretty. You better be careful. Say, you reap what you sow. Come on, we can do better. You reap what you sow. Job 4, 8. As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble, reap it. Can somebody say, you reap what you sow. Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, for the measure you give, it will be measured to you. Can somebody say you reap what you sow? sow. Jeremiah 17, 10. This is the last verse and we'll close it up. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their, say it with me, according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. As we get ready to put a bow on top of this package, let me just ask you a question. Anybody in here play racquetball? You, you two can play each other, all right? It looks like two people, one-on-one. All right, we got one-on-one-on-one. He'll take the winner, right? Uh, here's the deal. Racquetball, I don't know a lot about it. Better question, how many of y'all know what racquetball is? There they are, okay, good. So racquetball, you have this little ball and it bounces and you can hit it with the racket and it hits the wall and it comes back to you. Anybody played wall ball before? Wall ball, yeah, there you go. Wall ball, you hit it up against the wall and it comes back. And, and, and so, so the, the strength of that, if you hit it really hard and you swack that thing, it's gonna hit the wall really hard and it's gonna come back really hard. Somebody say you reap what you sow. I was thinking about how you and I reap what we sow every day. Every day you and I have an opportunity to reap what we sow. And it's all done through this right here, our mouth. Our mouth. Consider this for a second. Whatever you're, you're giving out, you're gonna get back. I, I asked who's engaged, who's been um, newly married in the last two to three years? Put your hands up, two to three years. You've been newly married. I see y'all, see y'all, see y'all. Yep, yep, yep. Good, good. All right, newly married last two or three years. Um, and, and usually newly married people, before they have kids, what's the common rule that you have to get before you get a kid? Some of y'all don't know the rules, all right? What you gotta do is you gotta get a dog first. And the reason you get a dog when you get married, you're, you're, getting, you're like, you're just married you don't know if you're quite responsible yet. And you're like, before we bring a baby into the world, I gotta make sure I actually can handle something. And so you gotta test the waters with a pet. And so you get this dog. So by the way, Dylan, let me just tell you how the system works because you're, you're engaged, all right? You, 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 you get the dog and you figure out what you know and don't know. And you go, well, yeah, I'm not responsible. And then you learn how to be a little more responsible. But about six months, so she asks you for a pet, we're in trouble. If she asks you for a pet, we're in trouble. Let me tell you, if you ask him for the woo, because that means once you get a pet, you're about six months away from having a baby. It's about a six month window there of like, okay, I figured it out, it's time to have some babies, right? 
And so what I learned whenever I first got married is we, were, we got this little dog and the dog always takes on the personality of the owner. Y'all seen that? The dog like, like it, sometimes you go to somebody's house and the dog like running all over like wild animal. And you're like, that actually makes sense. These people are crazy. And then, and then sometimes you go to somebody's house and you're like, dude, this dog is like, if I had a dog like that, I'd have a dog. Cause the dog's all calm and peaceful and does all the tricks and like goes and gets the mail and all like all the things. You're like, dude, this thing's awesome. Takes on the personality of the owner. You reap what you sow. I think about the way that we talk to one another. Think about your marriage for a second. If you don't like what you're getting back from your partner, look at what you're giving. If you don't like what you're getting back, you need to look at what you're giving out. Because the dog takes on the personality of the owner, right? Uh, it's not too different with children. When the children come, then what happens is uh, um, they watch you and they learn from you. So parents, where are my parents at in the room? Make some noise, parents, parents. be. Yeah, all right. Nobody booed about it. That's a good thing, all right? We're winning if we're not mad about it. This is good. So, so but if we're, if we're parenting and we're like, dude, my kid, he's always got an attitude. He's always got a chip on his shoulder. He's always in a bad mood, always negative, always critical. Hello, somebody, you reap what you sow. My question to you is every time you're in his presence, are you just reaping what you sow? I get no amens on that. At least my non-married people, amen me on that one so that way I feel like somebody's still listening because the married people, they turned against me right there. The parents people, it turned against me right there. Think about it though, you reap what you sow. When I play ping pong, where are my ping pong players at? Come on, where are my ping pong players? Where are my ping pong players at? That's not even a song, but I think it should be, okay. Where are my ping pong players at, okay? Now listen, there's different kind of ping pong players. There's my daughter, Amberly, who we try to do P- I-N-G to see who gets to serve first and we never get to play because we never get to get past P-I-N-G. When I'm playing with her, I play real soft. How many of y'all know how to play ping pong? Like, like, like you know how to play, not the rules. You know how to play ping pong. Jason, I see you, my boy. We need to play. You know how, do you know how to curve it? Oh yeah, yeah. You know how to curve it and whenever it bounces off the table, it goes so sideways that I have no chance? We're gonna find out, right, right, right. Listen, when I see somebody who can play ping pong like that, I match the level of intensity that I get back. If he swacks his meal, pop, pop, pop. Y'all seen those dudes? Dude, those Chinese dudes, you seen the video of the Chinese guys playing? Oh my word, that video of the Chinese players is the most insane thing I've ever seen. I wish I knew their names. They are insanely good. And they go for like an hour of just back and forth. You're like, every shot I would have missed. They would kill us, Jason, they would kill us but I wanna play you. So listen, I match the intensity. You reap what you sow, y'all. If you don't like what you're getting back, look at what you're giving. If you're cursing one another out, hello, church, hey, if you're cursing each other, what do you expect to get back? If you're an employer and you have employees and you treat them like garbage, don't be shocked whenever they give you bad attitude back. You reap what you sow. Hello, employee. If you treat your boss horribly and you talk bad about him all the time and you gossip about your boss all the time, don't be shocked when you reap what you sow. Here's the reality. We have to examine our hearts. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct. Our conduct is a choice. It's a choice that you and I get to make. Somebody treats you poorly, you don't have to respond in kind. They treat you poorly, you say, okay, I'm not gonna do that. That's a great example of what I'm not gonna do. Instead, I'm gonna trust the Lord to deal with that person. Vengeance is his, revenge is his, says the Lord. He will repay, the Bible says. You don't have to do anything. You stand back and you wait. I want you to just bow your heads in prayer real quick. Bow your heads in prayer. I wanna take about 60 seconds for you to pray. Consider the areas of your life where you're reaping what you're sowing and maybe you go, I need to not do some things. God's showing me some stuff I need to change. 
I think the biggest travesty in church world today is in past generations, they'd have an altar call. And they'd say, if you need to repent of anything, get up out of your seat, you come forward, you walk the aisle, and you repent. And you know, we moved away from that because our culture changed and people became very sensitive and they began to worry about the idea of people looking at them and they feel embarrassed. And the biggest tragedy to the church is the fact that we have forgotten what it looks like to repent for anything. And I wanna call us back to a heart of repentance for these areas where we go, we gotta change. If we don't like what we're getting, we gotta look at what we're giving. Take 60 seconds to go to God. All right, y'all, look up at me for one second. The principle of reaping what you sow works right here, anywhere we go, any relationship we have. I was thinking about reaping what you sow. I said, does that work all the time? Well, the Bible says it does, so yes, I believe it. But I go, does it hold true everywhere? It holds true everywhere with human beings. There's one relationship that you and I have where it doesn't hold true. Our relationship with God. Think about it, consider it for a second. What we've given to God many times is we ignore him, we rebel against him, we get angry at him. All the things that we shouldn't do, we throw upon God. And here's how God is. He doesn't sow back to us all that. He says, I see you in your stress and your anger and your depression and your frustration and and you're cursing me and you're ignoring me and I love you and I'm merciful for you and I'm caring towards you and I will do anything for you. I'll provide for you and protect you and care for you. I'll do all. He, we don't reap what we sow when it comes to us and God because if we reaped what we sow with us and God, we'd all die and go to hell. That's what we all deserve based upon what we sow. Yet God said, in spite of what you've done in your past, I'm going to that cross to pay for all that nasty, ugly stuff. And when I shed my blood on that cross and I rise back to life on the third day, you can know that I'm God and you can follow me and have your life transformed. He gives us what we don't even deserve. He gives us mercy. I'm so grateful for that. If you'd like to have a relationship with God, I wanna lead you through a prayer of what they call a prayer of salvation. Repeat after me, say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. Let's welcome people into the family of God, church. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer along with me, I would love for you to text new me with no spaces to the number on the screen and we would send you some more information about that decision that you made. Give you a quick building fund update. Uh, Church is growing, we're looking to expand. The new number is $398,251. We're getting so close y'all. Getting really close to being able to add to the campus. Thank you to everyone who's already contributed through your tithes and offerings and going above and beyond. Cannot do this without you. Uh, Our first stop is to get to $500,000. So we're 102,000 away from making a big move. So help us get there. Consider this week. We're gonna say goodbye to online campus on the count of three. One, two, three. Goodbye.